Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to all of you present today. We believe that all of you are at home and safe. So today's special webinar is all about knowing how to write a winning SOP. And before we jump into the session, a little bit briefing about galvanized test prep who we are and what exactly we do. So um, as you see, galvanized test prep is actually founded and managed by alumni from top universities like Howard, Stanford, IIT, Madras, and IIM Ahmedabad. And what exactly we do? So we do help you in your test preparations for SAT, GRE, IELTS, and TOEFL. And not only that, but yes, our team of experts will help you in your admission counseling for services like bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree. Apart from that, we are at your back for your last minute assistance, for example, loan providers, courier services, foreign exchange, and many other such activities. Uh, here, a little bit about our Quora presence. I'm sharing the link on the chat box. Please do check our Quora as well. And as you can see, 65 plus countries have chosen Galvanize in their journey of studying abroad. Not only this, but we have happily placed our, you know, our students across 1,000 plus universities, across 18 plus countries out there. And not only that, yes, we have helped at 140 plus specializations out there. A little bit briefing about your host for today's webinar for writing a winning SOP. Her name is Divya Srinivas, and she holds an MA in journalism from the University of Top Missouri, which is a ranked top three national wide. And uh, after completing her master's, she did her uh, PhD in communication and journalism from another top university, that is University of New Mexico. And here we are happy to have her as, you know, she will be helping and she's responsible for admission counseling services for our students across various segments like MS, MBA, and UG. So without any further delay, over to you, Divya. Thank you all for attending today's event. We're very excited. We are beginning a, a bustling uh, admission season. Uh, so many people ready to start off their uh, new career trajectories, and we are very happy to help them. Um, there are many the most common factors that universities consider uh, when accepting students for graduate studies. Many of you, most of you will be interested in uh, master's programs. Some of you may be more inclined to research like me and some of my colleagues and may want to do PhDs. Uh, whatever your choice may be, there are some very common factors. Uh, all of them will require you to submit your transcripts uh, from all post-secondary education. So all colleges and universities that you have attended as part of your higher education, you will have to submit your transcripts. They are going to look at your test scores, uh, GRE and uh, IELTS or GRE and TOEFL or GMAT and any English proficiency. They're going to look at your letters of recommendation, statement of purpose, uh, and, and your resume. Uh, today's session focus, focuses primarily on today's session focuses primarily on the SOP. So these were the documentation I'm I was talking about. They're going to look at your academics, your test scores. Um, your SOPs and LORs, and your resume, which will talk about your internships and research projects and whatnot. Some of you who are more interested in research than others may have done research as part of your uh, college projects. Some of you may have not done any research at all. Not to worry, most US universities are research-based programs. But at the master's level, you have the thesis option as well as the project option. So if you're more research inclined, you're likely to apply for MS with these. Uh, if you're more research inclined, you'd apply for an MS with thesis. Um, and if you're not very research inclined, but you're ready to get on uh, and jump into the industry and get your hands dirty with various uh, corporate assignments, then you may choose the non-thesis option. Whatever the case may be, uh, one skill that you need to have is to be able to learn independently, either through a creatively designed uh, professional and or research projects. So that has to be, a, the, essentially your application has to demonstrate your preparedness for graduate studies. That's what your application is going to 
look at and the sop lors and your resume will be able to determine your preparedness along with your performance at your academics in your ug level and your aptitude for study abroad through testing performance in the gre and tofl or ielts or gmat right so these are things that admissions committees look at i already see some questions on the chat box uh, nallap nall nallap ready i will get to your questions so please hold that thought till the end of the presentation thank you so the focus of today's presentation is basically the sop uh, why are we discussing the sop today because this is one aspect of an application that's not typically uh, found in most uh, domestic university applications like majority of the universities in india have look at your uh, cgpa from undergrad or or your high school most of them look at your uh, uh, entrance exams the various entrance exams that you take a lot of them look at uh, even your recommendation letters or your past research work but very few of them in india would expect you to write an sop so the sop is a very unique document to studying abroad in countries like uh, in in most english most other english speaking countries so today's presentation is about the sop and usually i find that the students get nervous around the sop because it's you know we don't come from a culture where we talk about ourselves in india the less we talk about ourselves the better because we are expected to conform so much that we hardly ever put our best foot forward right but in the us that is not so in many other english speaking countries that is not so you are expected to put your best foot forward you are expected to basically market yourself and your sop is your opportunity to market yourself most universities receive thousands of graduate applications right out of that universities may select anything from 15% to 75% of their applicants so what i'm saying is acceptance rates at ms and phd programs vary from university to university and acceptance rates range from 15% of the applicants to 75% of the applicants depending on various programmatic priorities now given that there is such a latitude in acceptance rates how are you going to distinguish yourself from other applicants people who apply to us universities uk universities canada australia wherever you may apply we be applying are applying from all over the world you know so i often tell my students you need to get out of the frog in the well mentality and put on a global thinking hat because right now you are playing in the global field you are no more it is not any more enough to be the best candidate in your class or the best candidate in your college or even the state for that matter you need to think larger and larger and larger and position yourself in a larger scheme of things from applicants around the world right so just want to put that in perspective to begin with so we are entering a very very competitive playing field while your cgpa and your gre scores are a very important factor in your application there may be many students who score the exact same gre score as you there may be many students whose gpa is very similar to yours and many of their transcripts may translate into exact same equivalency to us education so how do you distinguish your distinguish yourself from any other candidate and your sop is literally your opportunity to speak with your unique voice to the admissions committee be prepared to tell the admissions committee your personal story of how you have evolved as a researcher or a professional or a student or an academic how have you evolved and how at this point in your life 
the best thing you can do for yourself is take up graduate studies right so the sop is literally your opportunity to sell yourself to the admissions committee among hundreds of others who may have gpas and scores very similar to yours so you don't want to become a flower on the wall right you want to be able to project your candidacy as better than anybody else's candidacy now that said how do you make yourself better than anybody else when you don't know who else is applying even though it's 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 a it's a very good question and you should ask yourself that you don't know who else you who else is applying so in part we are applying blind right we don't know who else is there in that playing field so how do we know what i need to put on my sop that's better than someone else now this is when i always tell my students at the end of the day the best thing you can do your do is to be better than your own self so to do that you need to first start by thinking very critically about yourself your strengths and your weaknesses be honest with yourself and that honesty will translate into your sop in a manner that stands out and reflects your true potential and that is what we want to see so when you're critical of yourself we want to see that you are having personal insights uh you know and i say personal insight because i often find students you know they've done eight projects nine projects in their undergraduate studies and they in their sop is nothing but a list and a brief description of all the nine projects that they've done admissions committee doesn't understands that students go through a process of discovery and in order to discover themselves they may be dabbling in many things important and some less important for you the focus should be on understanding how you have evolved as an academic or a student or an individual or a professional out of these projects what were you like before and what were you like after how have these projects uh helped you hone in on your passion and without passion i'm afraid it will be very difficult for your statement of purpose to stand out right so we want to see that passion come out in your statement of purpose and the passion should reflect your exposure your experience and everything that you have learned and your enthusiasm to move forward in this world and push the world forward ahead uh, and advance the particular field that you want to distinguish your distinguish yourself in right so we want to work on your personal insights so what we are going to do today is just give you a little bit of a tool that you can use to start thinking critically about yourself and most business uh, uh, people who have had exposure to business will be familiar with what we call the swot analysis strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats now often times we do swot analysis for that you know toothpaste product or that television uh, launch or a new a uh, smartphone that's going to be launched marketing people do these swot analysis all the time to understand the strengths and weaknesses and positioning their products now we are going to take those ideas and do it for your own self where you are able to think critically about what your strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats are and how you are using this to further advance your own position in society So let's begin with strengths and why is it important. Now to talk about strengths you have you all have skills and talents that you have gained from going through your college curriculum or your internships and other professional experiences. We all have skills and knowledge that we have le learned. It's important to tell the admissions committee what that is. Now don't give us a list of who all you have worked with 
uh, and all of your roles and responsibilities and um, every course that you have ever taken. That is not what the admissions committee wants to see. The admissions committee wants to see that you are aware of yourself. You are aware of what it is that you bring to the table. So think of it as a job. If somebody is to hire you, why should they hire you? You have, you have to be hired because you're going to bring something unique to the team. So if applying for a graduate program is no different in this regard. They want to see that you're going to bring something to the graduate school. Uh, to that extent, they want to know how your education so far and how your experiences so far have shaped you. What skills have you learned? What talent have you gained? Uh, these skills can be technical. It can be based on, uh, it can be leadership related. It can be people management, whatever it is. Specifically, if it is related to the program that you are applying for, that's very important for us to know. Do you have unique resources that others cannot access? Now, these may be resources in terms of uh, scientific collaborators or uh, professional mentors. Um, it may be other ac access to other very niche, niche labs. Like I have had students who have uh, done DST funded grants, uh, Department of Science and Technology. Uh, they have worked on Department of Science and Technology funded grants. They've done research. Uh, projects with the uh, other scientists and published papers uh, and I now those students are studying at uh, Ivy League universities in the United States right so we want to know what those unique resources are that you have access to that uh, have shaped your development so far so don't be shy to put that up front uh, and oftentimes uh, we are defined by the people we have come to know. So it's very important to think about how other people view us. So don't hesitate to talk to some very close people, uh, people who are very close to you. And I don't mean your best buddy who goes out uh, to eat samosas after a game. Uh, when I say others who know your strengths, I'm talking about other mentors, uh, your professional supervisors, uh, other colleagues you may have worked with, um, you may have been a part of some uh, technical or social club in, in college. Uh, according to them, what are your strengths? So don't hesitate to talk to some of your own peers, colleagues, uh, mentors about what they think your strengths are. And, and do this, of course, before you start writing your SOP because you want to get a better idea of how you should position yourself to the admissions committee, which comes to our next point. What is your unique selling proposition? Everybody must have a unique selling proposition because it is this proposition that is going to distinguish you from any other candidate. Many of us go to, you know, CBSC schools, we all attend uh, engineering colleges or uh, so, you know, uh, so arts and science colleges. We all have very similar backgrounds, but we all don't have experienced the world in the exact same way. Right? We all bring something unique to the table. You must be in touch with what it is that is unique about you. And uh, you don't have to be boastful about it, but be honest about it and see that as your strength and see how that strength can become a uh, productive uh, contributor to the university that you're going to apply to. The next thing that you want to be very critical about is your weaknesses. You know, in India, we are all spoon fed. Uh, you know, people never say anything bad about us. Everybody wants to, the smallest thing we do is, is, uh, uh, rewarded or everybody praises the smallest accomplishments that we have so it's very easy for us to lose focus on our true weaknesses you know um, because our, oftentimes we are cushioned uh, our fall is cushioned by so many people who care so much about us maybe too much about us that we hardly see failure and failure if you have experienced it professionally or personally use it to your advantage because failure often is a 
is a learning experience. We all learn from failure. Nobody learns without failing, whether it is tinkering with uh, electronic components and burning your fingers or writing a, a program code that crashes your computer, whatever it may be. Uh, we learn from our failures. So be aware of what your weaknesses are because at the end of the day, you're applying to be a student and the job of the student is to be a learner, right? If you have no weaknesses, then why do you need to go and learn something? Everybody has weaknesses. Everybody has things they can improve. So be aware of what it is that you need to improve and make sure you, you state in your statement that that is the reason for going to graduate school. You want to go to graduate school to improve on these XYZ factors, right? So you can convert your weakness into an opportunity for growth uh, from an admissions perspective. So don't hesitate to think critically about failures. Don't hesitate to think critically about uh, knowledge gaps or professional gaps um, in your development trajectory. Opportunities. Be aware of trends in your industry. Oftentimes, I find college graduates in India have no idea of what trends in the industry are. Today, we have, you know, when I went to graduate school, internet was just emerging. We didn't have smartphones. We had internet cafes. We had to spend hours in an internet cafe to get information that was online, which nowadays you, you students have in the tips of your fingers. Use that tips of your fingers instead of texting friends and sharing fun sound bites all the time. Find out what trends in your industries are. What are the societies or groups or trade magazines in your profession that is giving you information about the direction your industry is moving in? Right? So be aware of trends in your industry. Who are the movers and shakers of your industry? Do you know which are the companies that are at the top of the pyramid? What are these companies doing? What are the types of people they are hiring? What qualifications are they looking for? You need to know this because in knowing what companies are looking for in their employees, you will identify your knowledge gaps and use those knowledge gaps as fodder for your reason to attend graduate school at this time. So go to the uh, employment web page of perhaps five companies that you dream of being employed by. Look at the various job descriptions they have put out. Identify the skills they are looking for and see if you have those skills. If you don't, that's okay because you're going to apply to graduate school to get those skills, right? So don't hesitate to do your research on the industry and become familiar with the professional world. Now, if you're interested in research, you can do the same. Uh, in your in your research field, identify what your areas of research interests are. Google professors at various universities who are doing research in areas that you are look uh, are you, that you are uh, interested in. Email them. Tell them you're interested in doing research in this area. In order to pursue this, how do you need to prepare yourself further? Right. Get in. Get into as many online. Uh, uh, chat forums and online uh, information sessions that you can have access to. So the internet has a lot of resources that you can use in order to, order to identify trends in your industry, movers and shakers of your industry, employment direction. And I say employment direction is because when you look at employment websites of various companies, you can determine the type of skills that are more and more future looking. Right. Because you're not preparing for a year from now. You're not going to go to graduate school to be employed two or three years from now. You're going to graduate school to be employable. 
10 years from now. So try to see what are you going to need 10 years from now to be employable in your industry? What are they looking for? What are people talking about? What is the direction in which advancement is taking place in your industry? And what are the projections for the future? How do you need to be ready? These are things you need to be talking about when you look at opportunities and how you're going to be prepared for those opportunities. And then we talk about threats. Now threats, if you're looking at competitors, anybody who is going to apply for admission to that university, that the same university that you're going to apply to is your competitor. And trust me, they have also done a SWOT analysis. Right? So in, 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 in the immediate hour, your competitors are going to be other applicants. In the future, your competitors are going to be other candidates who are applying for the same job. And even beyond that, as you grow in your profession, your competitors are going to be other product owners or other uh, people who are innovating or doing whatever it is that you will be doing best in your industry. So competition is just the way of life. Um, oftentimes we are shielded from it, uh, shielded from it uh, or from the reality of it uh, in our home countries. But that's not always the case when we move out of the comfort zone that we have built for ourselves. So be aware that you are operating in a very competitive scape. And in that competitive scape, what are some challenges to your personal advancement or your professional advancement or your academic advancement? Be aware of that. And is graduate study going to fill that gap? Now, oftentimes I have students who come and say, you know, I'm, I want to apply for a PhD program, not a master's program, because a PhD program is funded. And I tell students, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Right. Applying for funding with a graduate program. Is the same as applying for a job. If you're going to get paid, you have to deliver something. There is an expectation that you will deliver something. And that something usually in an academic setting is research or teaching. Or some kind of creative endeavor or innovative endeavor. Right. So if monetary constraints for example are a problem and that is the reason to apply for a phd i'm afraid that reason is not enough to apply for a phd program because uh, there is no such thing as need based funding for graduate studies all graduate studies are funded either based on your scholarly or professional caliber if you have the scholarly or professional merit then students will be funded. If they are funding you, it is because they think that you're very employable on the projects that they have going on. And that you have the potential to contribute to the projects that they have going on. So essentially your SOP has to convince them that you have a very good understanding of what is going on in their program and that you are absolutely the one with the skill, talent, and enthusiasm to fill that need. Unless one is successful, successfully proves that it will be very, very difficult to get funding at a master's or PhD level. Right? So that is something I wanted to make very clear up front. Um, but other things like technological changes may be threatening your position in your current professional scape. If you understand that, do not hesitate to acknowledge it because graduate program is the best place for you to technically uh, upgrade yourself. 
or upgrade your management skills. These are perfectly good reasons for you to pursue graduate study. Uh, as long as the coursework, the advanced coursework is going to help you with your future goals and aspirations. It is a very reasonable rationale to pursue graduate study at this time. Funding alone is not. So in doing this process, try to see if there are any other constraints to your goal achievement. And if you know what they are, you can use your weaknesses as well as your threats as the areas of growth through a graduate program. And therefore, the need of the hour is for you to pursue graduate studies. So I hope that you will all do a SWOT analysis of yourself before you start putting pen to paper on this 800 word document that you will have to submit to the university called the Statement of Purpose. So a Statement of Purpose, when you start writing it, it has usually a very logical structure. It's about 800 words and it has at least three parts, an introduction, body, and a conclusion. The reason why we discuss this structure is because in Western countries, uh, most Western uh, essays or uh, documents have this logical structure. And admissions committees that are reading through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents a day, uh, sifting through, through so many students, they expect that the student will write in this format. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them to find the information that they are looking for. So it's best to follow a format that people expect you to write in. While the content may be unique and exciting and uh, different, you want to stay as close as possible with an introduction body, conclusion, prose type writing rather than poetry. I, I know a lot of you may be very poetic and very creative in that way, but prose is what admissions committees want to see they want you they don't want to do any guessing work they don't want to assume they don't want to infer or interpret they want upfront in 800 words almost like an executive summary of who you are what are your strengths why graduate school right now how will you be able to contribute to the program and finally why are you applying to this university very straightforward Right. So think of it as a as a executive summary of yourself to the admissions committee so they can make a quick decision. Right. That said, uh, we don't usually have tables or graphs in statement of purpose. It's usually 800 words. Um, text document. Uh, going through the various individual parts of an introduction. Now, I'm going to start this discussion uh, on the parts of, a, of, a, of an essay with the introduction. However, I must caution you that don't get stuck with writing the introduction in the very beginning, right? You can always write and craft your introduction after you know what you're going to put down in the rest of your essay and come back to it. But these are simply ideas that you can follow in. Uh, preparing the introduction of your essay. So some of the tools that you can use to have an attention getter. Now, as I said, admissions committees are sifting through hundreds, if not thousands of essay documents through the admission cycle, right? So you want to hook the reader early on. In fact, you want to hook the reader within the first two sentences of your essay. If you're not hooking the reader by then, they are going to lose interest in that document very, very quickly and set it aside. So we don't want that to happen. We want you to get the best read possible. So here are some things that you can do to get the attention of your reader early on. Rhetorical generalizations, surprising facts, quotations, and anecdotes. These are some tools we'll discuss in a little bit more detail that you can follow in order to 
get the attention of the reader. So let's talk about rhetorical generalizations. Often it's a general statement about your subject. Now, remember earlier I told you, be aware of trends in your industry, right? And trends in your industry is a general prediction about the direction your industry is going to take in the future. And this may be established by some of the leaders in your industry or some of the uh, groups of leaders in your industry will meet and decide this is where we see this industry going. You can use statements like that. You can use generalize your understanding of general directions about your industry and use that knowledge to emphasize your passion for the field, but also your understanding of how this field is growing. Right? So that should interest the reader immediately because at least they know that you have done your background work and you're not coming here clueless, right? So here's an example of what a rhetorical generalization may be. So because recycling technology isn't cost effective yet, we'd be better relying on traditional garbage disposal while using funds currently allocated for recycling to deliver, develop new efficient recycling technology. Now, this may be the statement of purpose for a student who is applying to graduate studies or graduate research areas focused on re recycling technology. Environmental studies or environmental engineering. Those may be the candidates who write perhaps a starting statement like this. Now, your introduction will typically have about 100 words. So while this is a very broad and general statement about recycling technology, how does this statement relate to you? Now, that could be the next lead in to this statement. For example, you could discuss maybe a project that I had done on uh, developing sensors to identify uh, specific types of uh, segregation mechanisms or some such you know you you can use this generalization as a segue into something very specific that you have done that has impassioned you to now pursue graduate studies and hence apply to this program right so you can start with a generalization relate how this generalization ties into something specific that you have done which is motivating or inspiring you to apply to graduate studies. And that is a good introduction to who you are. Now, and the body can then discuss about how you got there and how a graduate program is going to help you in the future. Right? So that is how a rhetorical generalization could work uh, for an introductory paragraph of your essay. Another tool you could use is talk about surprising facts. Uh, you know, these could be statistics or trivia or obscure information related to your subject uh, that you find uh, interesting, pertinent, or extremely urgent. Creates a sense of sometimes, sometimes statistics create a sense of urgency. 80% um, of the people who have, uh, who are suffering with diabetes do not have the right tools to uh, measure their uh, sugar consumption and therefore we need to develop uh, XYZ products um, to be able to measure individuals sugar consumption that's an example right so that could be a biomedical engineering statement or in this case we have an essay that argues for uh, recycling sewage water so you get, again, to get these facts, to get these statistics, you'll have to do your research, look into some of the uh, publications that you have access to, uh, trade journals that you have access to that publishes the, these facts that are relevant to areas of interest, your areas of interest, and use that information in, uh, to introduce your 
subject areas of interest that should then tell us why the urgency in applying for a graduate program at this time right so facts are very important uh, and a very logical way of connecting the world to what it is that you are doing and what it is that you plan to do in the future and there is no dearth of published facts available online so um, you should be able to find this a very interesting tool most of the times if you read newspaper articles a lot of them will start off lead the story with facts with statistics a lot of marketing journals will lead with facts and statistics right so um, do not uh, hesitate to use and cite reliable sources on statistics right so as much as possible identify a reliable source from which you can use stats on quotations is is often used you can quote uh, any leaders in your industry you can quote other people who inspire you you can even quote some mentor of yours who has really inspired you to choose your field of study right while a, a a quote may be a common observation you need to lead in in the introduction if you're leading the introduction in with a quote you need to tell us why that quote is important for you how does that quote relate to your development and advancement and aspirations and goals as it relates to your graduate program at the end of the day everything that you say and do has to relate to you and your reason for applying to graduate school right so feel free to use a quote but don't leave it hanging there impersonally personalize the and interpret the quote to your context and your desire to pursue graduate studies at this time anecdotes are short stories about yourself these could be some turning points in your life that triggered your passion for the subject or triggered your desire to go to grad school uh, whatever they may be uh, try to make it into a very descriptive and interesting story that transports the audience and at the same time uh, ropes them in into the next paragraph subsequent paragraphs of your essay right so use anecdotes anecdotes is a, are a great way for you to uh, share perhaps some things that have sparked a light bulb while you have done your own swot analysis yeah so in doing your swot analysis you may recount a lot of personal experiences that you've had that have led you to this point in your life capture those and see the most interesting ones that are relevant to your graduate school application and use them in your introduction to help the committee better understand who you are so those are the tools that you can use to make your introduction interesting so now let's move on to the body of the essay in your body of the essay the admissions committee wants to see what is your personal development or your professional development what are your short and long term goals highlight your strengths and weaknesses that we talked about previously derive from your swot analysis your motivation for graduate study specify any people who have influenced your the direction that you are taking in your career emphasize your preparedness for graduate study and how you may contribute to the graduate program that you're applying to right these are probably six things that you must cover in the body paragraphs of your essay i'd say your body paragraphs can be two or three paragraphs depending on length and what not but not more than that so speaking of professional development describe significant achievements responsibilities related to postgraduate study right you as i said you may be 
you may have done eight ten projects you might might have had industrial visits and internships and perhaps even worked for a couple of years after it's not enough for us to list each and every achievement this is not your resume this is your statement of purpose so be in, insightful in talking about your achievements how has each milestone in your life led you to make these next steps take these next decisions or next steps based on your understanding of your own skills knowledge as well as understanding of where it is that the world is moving your world your industry your career your profession your field subject your understanding of where your subject area is moving in the future right so you have to be insightful so take stock of your experiences training don't list all of them but try to find the insights on how these various experiences helped you have helped you grow individually uh what are the main highlights of these experience like there might be a project from which you learned something that you could not have learned any other way there might have been you know many people are writing about i have taken machine learning courses uh or online you know if that's not what we are looking to see on your statement of purpose we want to see in taking those online courses were you able to have a personal and or professional breakthrough that you could not have had any in any other way and in having that breakthrough how is that going to help you advance your career through graduate studies right so talk about personal breakthroughs you've had not just listing the signal or listing your achievements your responsibilities or your roles but talk about breakthroughs you've had in skill knowledge and learning that is applicable to graduate school right and what are those skills as uh, that will be different from any other candidate who is applying to graduate studies along with you Right, so you have to be able to differentiate yourself. The next thing you want to discuss is your motivation. Here we are going to talk about you know people are either intrinsically motivated or they are extrinsically motivated. Intrinsically motivated people, for example, are simply motivated by the challenge, say, of problem solving or uh, the challenge of uh, overcoming uh, certain situations. people are intrinsically have the desire to overcome those challenges and they seek out challenges and they try to overcome it but others people they may not be intrinsically driven by the need or desire to overcome challenges they may be motivated by rewards uh, or they may be motivated by being in an environment filled with supportive uh, encouraging people uh, so whatever your motivation is you need to state that identify that motivation and place it in the sop so that the admissions committee knows how you may be better able to perform in your graduate program right so what is motivating you to do graduate studies at this time right what is the challenge in that for you right and how are you prepared to overcome those challenges is it a research group at the university that is motivating to you to solve some th problems that you're thinking about or is it perhaps overcoming some major burning research questions that you have that you're grappling with uh, to push you into the next trajectory of knowledge right whatever your motivation is you need to be able to articulate that in your statement of purpose not suffice to say i'll be getting the next best job uh, everybody knows that you become more employable with the right set of skills that you can earn at graduate school but it will be better for you to talk about the kind of job you would want to have which is why i had said earlier research on the job opportunities that are available in your dream companies right now what are the skills they are looking for and talk 
in your statement of purpose about how you want to equip yourself with those skills so that you'll be better suited to contribute to the industry in the future right so getting a job alone is not enough but what type of job what do you want to do how do you think you will be able to make your mark in this world right that is what we want to understand from your statement of purpose you have to as i said there are short term goals and long term goals now the short term goals may be things like i have to take my gre and and score a 320 i have to complete my toefl and do 110 those are short term goals right uh, while those are important for discussion with your counseling your statement of purpose is much more interested with your medium term goals and as well as your long term goals right as i said it's not enough to say i want to be employed uh, by xyz company what do you see yourself doing in that xyz company how do you see yourself contributing to that industry shaping that industry and moving that industry forward that is what we would like to see as your long term goals and your medium term goals can very well be how you would like to contribute at the university and what would you like to learn from the university and the faculty members who are available and other resources that are available to you at the university right so be able to think long term in order to derive what you will be able to do within the two year program in order to prepare yourself for the next 10 15 years right so admissions committees want to see that you have that kind of of vision for yourself because we all know that graduate programs are not cheap they cost anything from 10 20 to 40000 dollars a year are you going to apply to a graduate program just to find a job for the next 2 3 years you know, you want to be in an industry that is shaping the future of this world and you have to have a sense of where you're going with that right the more you're able to uh, gauge or get a pulse of that the better for you so while you may not be contributing at a at a macro level to shaping your industry you are making your own unique contributions to the job environment or the academic environment that you're in and this is your opportunity to look outside of your little universe and see who are the big players in your industry or your field who are shaping this field and how can you get closer to them so they are like the stars in the universe right how can you reach those stars what have they done to get there and what do you need to be to do to be able to reach those stars so find out who those stars are who are these influencers who are these role models who are shaping your field what are the standards they are setting and use them as inspiration to carve out your own 10 15 year plan to identify where you're going from here right so know who the influencers are and articulate your preparedness for graduate study so you need to demonstrate passion for your field discuss research exposure publications and conferences that are relevant to your area of study or proposed area of study you should show familiarity with scientific and professional conventions in your field for example if you're going to write your res resume and if you're going to write a publication or a conference paper on your resume you need to know whether your uh, industry follows an apa convention or a or a chicago manual convention or an mla convention to cite publications and conference presentations and use that format so demonstrate that you are familiar with the conventions in your industry uh, be aware of trends in research 
and industry. Uh, prove that you have the ability to contribute to the program. And finally, be able to answer why should the admissions committee choose you? That is the burning question here, right? Why should the admissions committee choose you? As I said, we don't know a whole lot about all the other applicants, but we know there are many of them with very, very similar backgrounds. So this SOP is your chance to set yourself apart from every other applicant. Right? So why should the admissions committee choose you? So for the conclusion, do your research on the target program. Learn the kind of uh, learn about the kind of research that is already going on with the faculty members at the program. All universities have web pages. Faculty members' research interests are all posted there. Uh, there's no dearth of information about the coursework or the activities that are ongoing in the program. So be proactive and learn about what is going on in your target universities. Identify professors that you'd like to learn from or work with. Demonstrate your knowledge of the research that is going on there. And also be able to articulate how you can fit in to that program. If there is research in your area of interest already going on there, tell the admissions committee how you'll be able to uh, contribute as a student researcher, um, etc. Use the conclusion to convince, convincingly articulate or summarize your goals as well as interest in the program and be able to leave a mark on them by the end so that they don't forget you while going through hundreds of other essays because they would have gone through hundreds of essays before you and hundreds of essays after you you want to leave a lasting impression on your admissions committee and that will be your conclusion right so questions to ask yourself uh, before shortlisting universities I said before shortlisting is because you want to be able to familiarize yourself with the program. You want to be able to familiarize yourself with the activities and the research at the university. So identify a sub area of interest within your field. What fresh perspectives do you have to offer? What is going on there? What line of inquiry do you wish to pursue? And why should the department really care about you, right? Because at the end of the day, we're all stars in the universe. Some stars are brighter and bigger than others. Some stars are smaller. We don't have to make ourselves bigger than what we are, but we have to make ourselves known and heard to people who don't know and know of us. And we can only demonstrate our potential through the merit of our own actions and our thoughts and our values. Be able to demonstrate that in your statement of purpose. Okay, so here are some general do's and don'ts. I know some of you are getting anxious to, to leave, so I don't want to take any much more of your time. We can get directly into the uh, FAQs, uh, and I'm happy to take questions right now. So as we have come to an end of the session, a little bit briefing about how can we help you in your journey of you know studying abroad. So here are our GRE uh, galvanized courses that we have for you, a GRE crash program for 45 days, GRE 90 for uh, 90 days plan, and GRE plus is for 180 days, it's basically six months, and a GRE one year program that's 360 for anyone who's planned for the exam after a year. These are the services that we follow for our admission counseling, wherein we will be first evaluating your profile. Based on your profile, your universities will be shortlisted, post which we will be helping in your documentation process, visa, and financing as well. And these are the admission counseling services that we have for you for MS, MD, and PhD. Along with that, yes, we do help you for your TOEFL and IELTS as well. And we have some exclusive offers for all of you today, and do check out our website. So by this, we have come to an end of the session. So um, 
we believe that the session was quite informative for all of you and in case if you have any further queries feel free to get in touch with us until then signing off from galvanized test prep stay home stay safe